the Shark Deck. Hello, I'm Johnny Mack with your daily comedy news. During the week, Vulture updated their best comedy specials of 2023 so far. I haven't really looked at this. Let's take a look at what they think. All specials listed from newest to oldest. So they have Chris Fleming's Hill up at the top. I enjoyed that one. Super quirky, but yeah, that that one's worth checking out. John Early's Now More Than Ever. That wasn't bad. That's also on my list. Ali Sadiq's The Domino Effect. I think I started that one and it didn't grab me. John Mulaney's Baby J. I just, I, I didn't like it. I just felt like John... It didn't feel real to me as for as much press as there's been about that special. I just felt like John was shocking stories. Uh, I, I can't really explain it. It just it didn't connect with me that special the way some of Mulaney's other stuff did. Monique. My name is Monique. I don't think I have checked that one out. May Martin's SAP. I did not enjoy Kyle Canane's Shocks and Struts. That's a good one. That was on my list. I'm just skimming down here and I like this line that Vulture wrote. His cruise ship material conjures a nightmarish hedonistic carnival. Marlon Wayans, God Loves Me. I try that one, not for me. Mark Marin, and I've been on a big time Mark Marin kick lately from Bleak to Dark. I just didn't enjoy it. I bailed about halfway through. All right, John, what's your list? Here's what I have so far. Best special of the year is Todd Barry's Domestic Short Hair. You'll find that on YouTube. Shane Gillis on Netflix. I really like that one a lot. That's two. Tom Segura at three. Kinane at four. Nate Brigazzi at five. That's on Amazon. Hello World came out in January. Michelle Wolf at six. Jay McBride, Daddy's Girl, is on YouTube at seven. Jim Jeffries on Amazon from February is eight. Hari Kondabolu's on YouTube is nine. And Chris Rock, remember that was a big deal? Yes, some others on my list. Jimmy O. Yang, Roasted Mr. Peanut, Big J, Mark Normand, Nimesh Patel, Sarah Silverman, Chris Fleming, Hill at 17, John Early at 18, not on my list. Jim Gaffigan's Dark Pale, Joe Liss Yahoo special was fine, but it's not really special. Jared Freed, eh, it was okay. Amy Schumer, John Mulaney, Louis Black, Hannah Gatsby, Mark Marin, Andrew Santino, Britt Kreischer, Greg Warren, Kevin Hart, Lou Anel, and I have not seen Roseanne's special. Kat Timpf has a new book out. It is called You Can't Joke About That. She has done a few interviews. Thank you for Scott, who listens all the time, and we sometimes will trade an email on the side. And he sent me an interview Kat did with Reason. I thought that was pretty interesting. What about the argument some people advance that speech shouldn't be banned, but maybe certain types of speech should be disapproved of in such a way that it's almost the same as banning it? Kat said, don't erase anything, all right? In the summer of 2020, there was a piece saying how many different streaming services pulled episodes, uh, examples, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, 30 Rock, How I Met Your Mother. The interesting thing about How I Met Your Mother, where there was somebody who's more on the left who was saying we shouldn't erase anything because then we can't talk about it. I agree with that. The example she gave was the yellow face episode of How I Met Your Mother, where they dressed up as kung fu masters. And there was a debate at this time. Is this yellow face? Is this just silliness? But she actually got the character wrong that was actually dressed like that because it's a lot harder to have those conversations when it doesn't exist anymore. Kat also spoke with USA Today, and she knows that when she tells strangers that she works at Fox, conversation is likely to change and judgment will follow. She says, if I'm at a party, I'll be like, oh, I work in porn (laughs) because that's less controversial. Conan O'Brien was asked by guest Ed Sheeran about Conan's time as a writer and producer on The Simpsons. And Conan said, so many people think, oh, my God, this epic TV show known for its really good writers. Conan said, the people I got to work with are insanely talented and the room is just awful. The room is terrible. It looks like the worst. I mean, it did at the time. It's much nicer now. There was a bad shag carpet. Sofas that if you're in your first year of college or university, you just get them off the sidewalk. He said the writers would sit there and eat fried food while waiting for inspiration. There was a writer who smoked all the time who sat next to me, so when I die, it'll be because of him. It wasn't sexy or fun or cool at all. I remember we chewed up some caramel and put it together in a big blob and mashed it into the ceiling and then tried to get things to stick to it because you'll do anything to pass the time. I'd go and say, here's what I think should happen, and then have all these beats and ideas for an episode. And if they liked it, there was a little gong in the room. If the executive producer was really laughing, somebody would get up and bang the gong and say... That's going to be an episode. I remember the couple of times when they banged the gong when I said my episode, and I was so excited. One of Vulture's 25 comedians to watch is Opie Alagbaju. They asked Opie, what have you learned about your joke writing process? Opie said, for me, the best jokes take a long time to develop. I have jokes from when I first started that still aren't finished. Finding the balance of a joke is the hardest part. The only solution is to keep coming back and tinkering with the bit. All right, Opie, what comedy hill will you die on? His answer, I don't think comics should be allowed to post photos of themselves on stage from a show they know they bombed at. Best advice, worst advice? He says, the best comedy advice I got was to quit. (laughs) The worst advice I got was keep going. Nicole Byer spoke to Cosmo about Taylor Swift. 
Nicole's like, people won't stop talking about her. It's not that I don't like her. She's just not interesting to me. They were talking about Taylor at the football game a few weeks back. She was dipping chicken nuggets in some ketchup and ranch. Cosmo was like, I hear you're also a ranch fan. Nicole, people don't like this, but I love ranch and steak. I think it's delicious. I will literally put ranch on everything. Cosmo was curious. What prompted you to try that combination in the first place? Nicole said, you know, when you eat dinner at home with your family and whatever, and everything kind of goes on the same plate. I think I was having salad once and the ranch dribbled over to the steak. And then I was like, wait a minute, this is delightful and delicious. I used to go to a sandwich shop on the Upper West Side. They had the best ranch. One day I was raving about the ranch and I was like, what's in this? Is it homemade? What's your recipe? And then they took out a giant vat of Kraft Ranch. Like, it's nothing special. All right, we're all excited for the community movie if they ever actually film it. Vulture did an updated list of who is likely to be in the movie. Very, very, very likely to be in the movie because they were announced. Joel McHale as Jeff, Danny Pudi's Abed, Allison Breeze, Annie, Gillian Jacobs, Britta, Jim Rash as Craig the Dean, and Ken Jung as Ben. Dan Horman has claimed that all the cast members, other than Chevy Chase, have agreed to return. All right, what about Donald Glover's Troy? Harmon has confirmed there's no need to worry about that as the film was scheduled to be in production in Atlanta to accommodate Glover's schedule. Harmon told Variety last November, Glover is down to clown. I would not want to think about making the movie without Donald. Last month, he said Donald is coming based on word of mouth. He explained the deal might just not be official enough to confirm that Glover's part of the cast. Glover himself said, haven't seen the script, don't know, and in true Dan Harmon fashion, we'll probably get it on the first day, but yeah, it's supposed to be happening. All right, what about Yvette Nicole Brown's Shirley? Well, Joe McHale has tagged both Brown and Glover on Twitter in his post in announcing the movie. To that tweet, Brown responded, it's happening, congrats. So it seems like Shirley would be in the movie, all right? What about John Oliver's Professor Ian Duncan? A Reddit user has claimed earlier in the year they attended a taping of Last Week Tonight and asked Oliver about it. And at that time, John said he wasn't sure if he'd be able to do it because he's busy with Last Week Tonight. He said he'd like to do the movie if he could pop in whenever he had a break. All right, what about Jonathan Banks? He played Buzz Hickey. What about Paget Brewster's Frankie and Keith David's Elroy from the last season? No news on any of them. What about Chevy Chase's Pierce? I don't think that's going to happen. John Cleese said he's struggling to get guests willing to discuss woke issues on Cleese's new show for GB News. Cleese said, one university professor from Oregon told me more people have been fired during the woke period than were fired during McCarthyism in the 50s. They'd go after people, and an awful lot of people are very, very scared of that, which is why people with a higher profile have to discuss it as if they're not frightened of getting fired. Most people are frightened of getting fired, and the people who employ them are frightened of getting fired, and that end of woke is not very nice. His new show is called The Dinosaur Hour. It's aimed at, quote, dinosaurs who are out of touch. It also has a lot of very good guests who aren't celebrities. Yes, you've got to have a certain number of celebrities to get people to turn on, but then you can interview people who are really interesting, and a lot of celebrities aren't interesting at all. This show is for all who are out of touch, all the dinosaurs who are out of touch. You can be out of touch for two reasons. You can be voluntarily out of touch because you've given up, which is a very sensible point of view, or you can be out of touch without knowing it, but it's for those sorts of people. The new show will be set in a castle. <laughs> he said it was extraordinary. With the setting, I wanted to make it look like a very, very strange gentleman's club, a little like the bar in Star Wars. He almost made a new series for Netflix. And he said, I gave them six ideas and I thought two were really good and they never even called my agent back. And you kind of think, what are you looking for? I have no idea what they're looking for. The main thing is you get older is you realize very few people have any idea what they're doing. Fellow Monty Pythoner Michael Palin was interviewed by the Sunday Times and he talked about the emptiness he has experienced in the wake of his wife's death. Michael said, when someone's gone, someone who's been so much part of your life for the past 60 years, you can't believe they're not there to enjoy a little joke or an observation or complain about somebody. A great sort of emptiness comes in. Palin, who's 80 now, said his wife had relied on dialysis for many years in order to keep her alive and that she eventually took the decision along with her, the kids and the doctors to give it up. Palin said he'd never seen her happier in a way than during the final 10 days of her life after choosing to stop dialysis. She'd accepted it. We'd accepted it. She was in a wonderful hospice. The children and grandchildren had all come to see her, so her death was a great deliverance for her. Palin said he experienced a full circle moment when he had to register his wife's death, during which he saw a couple with a young baby at the registry office. And he said, I saw the father holding on his chest this tiny, tiny little newborn baby. And I thought, yep, that's it. A new person. One in, one out. I'm not going to leave you on that note.
Yahoo also talked to Palin, and uh, the topic is, can there be a Monty Python reunion? The answer, the O2 Arena shows in 2014 were our final hurrah. We got all the Pythons together, part, of course, for Graham, who died in 1989. For all of us, that was a remarkable series of shows. The great thing about Python was we were always keen to do something new and different. Taking a long run of shows around the world wouldn't have worked. We've gotten bored stiff. We were going to do four shows at the O2, and the bookings were so good, we did 10. It was terrific. The feeling from the audience was incredible. I don't think you could ever recreate that. We broke through some barrier with Python. Comedy shows were either dad's armies or sitcoms and easy to categorize. Python was scattergun. You didn't know what you were going to get when you sat down and watched Python. So many people like that. People don't always quote things, but they'll try to retell the sketch. Don't get it right. The Lumberjack song and the Spanish Inquisition are the ones people tend to do most. And that's your comedy news for today. If you like the show, tell a friend about it. Maybe they'll like it too. And all of you can follow the show for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your shows. See you here tomorrow.